But we should also know that some types of sinus node dysfunction and paroxysmal or even persistent AV block may still be related to enhanced parasympathetic tonus. So I think that there might be a common basics for all these different clinical conditions. And I think we may use a definition like vagally mediated arrhythmias to understand this potential relationship. Actually, there is a significant difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic systems according to innervation principles. For example, in whole body, we can divide the autonomic nervous system as extrinsic and intrinsic part. And if you look at the extrinsic part of autonomic nervous system in heart, you will see a very complicated interconnection within different levels. But basically, the main difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic system is related to localization of postganglionic synaptic bodies. And as you know that postganglionic neuronal bodies are located in stellate ganglia area and far from the heart in sympathetic system. Whereas in parasympathetic system, we know that great majority of postganglionic neuronal bodies are located in ganglionated flexus sites, which are concentrated within distinct epicardial fat fats area like this. So, what about the intrinsic part? We know that intrinsic part is consisting of ganglionated plexus sites. Firstly, Pachon at all stated that within a ganglionated plexus site, we see neuronal body of parasympathetic system and axonal fibers of sympathetic and sensory system. So according to this theoretical belief, we can imagine that uh, our lesion will be permanent in the parasympathetic system because we know that neuronal bodies cannot be regenerated after any damage. Whereas in the other system, our lesion will only affect axonal fibers of sympathetic and sensory neurons, so our lesion will be transient due to axonal regeneration process in the long term. But then different groups uh, published different papers by using immunohistochemical staining, and they demonstrated that we can also see sympathetic neuronal bodies, some local circuit neurons, and afferent sensory neurons within the ganglionated plexocytes. So today I can say that we can also denervate sympathetic system by using cardioneurobulation strategy. This is a totally new area for cardioneurobulation. But the main issue, where are these GPs? So we should know anatomical data to understand their localization. If you look at the animal experiment, there are two mainly used classification system or uh, nomenclature for ganglionated plexocytes. In the first one, Chiu et al. defined three GP area in the atrium, aorta superior vena cava GP, right atrium and uh, right pulmonary vein GP, and inferior vena cava left atrial GP. And then Yuan et al. studied with the same animal spaceman, but this time they defined more than five ganglionated plexus area around the atrium. So today I can say that the definition of Chu consisting of three GPs are not true anatomically, but to understand innervation principles of sinus node and atrioventricular node area, we, sh we should still use this three GP nomenclature in our current uh, approach. What about human data? In this well-designed study, Armour et al. tried to demonstrate the distribution of ganglionated plexus sites in human autopsy spacemen, and they defined seven ganglionated plexus area. But in that study, they also calculated the number of neuronal bodies within this GP site, and they demonstrated that the great majority of neuronal bodies are located in uh, these two ganglionated plexus area. And if you look at the here, you can see that the great majority of neuronal bodies are located between left atrial and right atrial structures. This is very important. And as another important point, they also demonstrated that the smallest GPs are uh, Marshall tract GP and left inferior GP, according to this anatomical data. We will use this anatomical data in uh, our electrophysiological approach. So it is important for us. In another uh, well-designed study, uh, Randall et al. studied the selective innervation principles of sinus node and atrioventricular nodal area. You can see the baseline recordings 
Uh, during vagal stimulation and vagal stimulation plus atrial pacing, you can see the right atrial and right ventricular electrograms in different steps. And as you know that during vagal stimulation, you will see a significant sinus bradycardia or asystole or significant AV block due to parasympathetic effect on atrioventricular and sinus node area. But what if you extract inferior vena cava left atrial GP sites? After extraction of this GP, they applied vagal stimulation again, and they saw still there was some uh, sinus bradycardia, but during atrial pacing, they didn't see any AV block episodes. So they think that this GP site provides vagal innervation of AV node area. And then they extracted uh, the right pulmonary and right atria GP site and applied vagal stimulation again. But they didn't see any sinus bradycardia or AV block during this application. So we can use the CHILS 3 GP based classification system to understand this selective innervation principles. This is very important. According to electrogram characteristics, in current approach, we use seven GP based nomenclature like Armour's definition. According to our classification, the first GP is Aorta Superior Venecava GP. Actually, it's a, a it's an entrance point for vagal innervation of full atrial part because most efferent vagal fibers to atria travel to this aorta superior vena cava GP and then project onto the other GP sites like this. So this, it's very important. The other one is right superior GP located between anterior wall of right superior pulmonary vena and posteroceptal wall of superior vena cava and mainly provides vagal innervation of sinus nodes. The other one is right inferior GP. You will see this GP site around interatrial septum area. The other one is posteromedial left GP located between lower part of left atrium and inferior vena cava and around coronary sinus ostium and provides vagal innervation of AV node. The other one is left superior GP located between left superior pulmonary vena and left atrial appendage in roof area. The other one is martial tract GP if you remember the localization of ligament of Marshall, it's very close to this uh, ligament. And the last one is left inferior GP or posterior lateral left GP located in posterior wall of left inferior pulmonary vein. What about the selective innervation principles in human? To demonstrate it, I think we can use the data of cardio ablation strategy. For example, before any ablation attempt in this case, Baseline IR interval is 810 milliseconds. Then we performed ablation in different GP sites, but especially we ablated right superior GP. If you remember, it provides the innervation of sinus node. So we see a significant increase on sinus rate after ablation on this GP site. Now the IR interval is uh, 508 milliseconds and peer interval is 184 milliseconds. If we want to increase AV conduction a little bit more, we should perform ablation in this posterior medial left GP site because it's important for AV node. And we did that. As you see, now the PR interval is 140, uh, 24 milliseconds. Finally, we finished the procedure with the ablation of aorta superior vena cava GP. It was an entrance point. So final error interval is 540 milliseconds. So, Despite our anatomical consideration, we should remember that localization of GPs demonstrates significant difference from one patient to another. So we need a method to detect their localization during electrophysiological study. Different groups use different techniques. Uh, you can see some of them, high frequency stimulation, spectral analysis, or empirical anatomic ablation. I will try to <clears throat> discuss this technique briefly. Uh, actually, um, HFS application will cause two different responses in different atrial parts. If you are in a normal atrial myocardium area, your HFS application will not cause any significant effect on PP or, or PR interval. But if you are in a ganglionated plexus site, your HFS application will cause a vagal discharge effect. So you will see a PP or PR prolongation during HFS application. This is the theoretical background of the technique. According to HFS responses, different groups uh, try to define localization of GPs. You can see the uh, two of those studies. 
In the first one, Nakagawa et al. defined five uh, main ganglionated plexus area around the left atrium, and then a similar uh, results was confirmed by Kim et al. recently. But there are some well-known limitations of HFS application. It's time consuming. There is still no consensus for prepare protocol and criteria for positive response are not identical between studies and it's very painful strategy and need general anesthesia. But I think that the most important limitation of the technique is induction of inadvertent atrial fibrillation episodes. If you look at here, according to our electrogram guided strategy, these two electrograms clearly de demonstrate the localization of GPs. But during HFS application, we just induced atrial fibrillation and we didn't see any uh, vagal response. So the question is why? Actually, it's understandable because we know that increased GP activity causes uh, cause a shortening on axion potential duration in pulmonary and myocytes. So it will cause an early after depolarization in this myocytes. So trigger the pulmonary event firing. So I think that the main limitation of this technique cause uh, induction of uh, atrial fibrillation episode. But we should understand that we are actually in the GP sites. But uh, we didn't get any positive vagal response to say this side to GP. It's very important. In the second method, um, spectral analysis, Pachon get a patent for a software providing real-time spectral post analysis. I will not explain the details of the technique because currently Professor Pachon don't use this technique. But briefly, they define two different electrogram or spectral characteristics according to fast Fourier transfer analysis response, if you see heterogeneous segmented spectrum, you can say that we are in the uh, vagal innervation area because there are a lot of inclusion of nervous fibers in this GP sites. This is the theoretical background of the technique. And then in core team compared this spectral potentials uh, and positive vagal response sites during HFS application, and they found uh, such a correlation between these two techniques demonstrated 70% sensitivity and 70% uh, specificity. But I think that the most important point, th there is still no gold standard for um, GP detection. So HFS is also not a good go a gold standard to, uh, to demonstrate localization of GPs. The last method is empirical anatomic ablation. You can maybe remember this figure from the latest expert consensus document, document on AFib ablation. And I think uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Saad and Dr. Davila uh, was the co-author of this uh, great publication. And according to this data, uh, authors state that the great majority of ganglionated plexus are located around pulmonary van ostea. But I would like to demonstrate to you some anatomical data from non-human mammals to human. Actually, we know that the great majority of GPs are not located around pulmonary vein ostea. So this is not enough to achieve vagal denervation uh, by using pulmonary vein isolation or circumferential ablation. So we need an easy method which, is be, uh, which should be reproducible, compatible with 3D mapping system and no additional equipment. This was the birth of our electrogram guided strategy, actually. We should try to find an um, easier method to detect localization of GPs. In this well-designed study, Lelucha and Shikumar et al. Uh, try to demonstrate electrogram characteristics according to Wagaga response during RF application. And they define three different electrogram types. Normal atrial electrogram, low amplitude fragmented electrogram, and high amplitude fragmented electrograms. And they found that if you see more than four deflection in electrograms, you will see positive vagal response during RF application in nearly 100% uh, of cases. So you can think that if you are see a positive vagal response, you are in you are close the uh, ganglionated plexus area. So to define that, you should only check the deflection number of the electrograms. This is a very important study. And then Pachon et al. Uh, compared 
different bandpass filter settings to detect uh, fragmentation in electrograms. And if you use high, high pass, higher, high best pass uh, filter settings during electrophysiological study, it will be better to uh, detect localization of fragmented electrograms. In our first work, we use a combination of spectral analysis and high frequency stimulation. Uh, before, we used an offline fast Fourier transform analysis to differentiate normal atrial myocardium sites and fibrillar atrial myocardium sites. And then, once we found fibrillar atrial myocardium sites, we applied high frequency stimulation in these areas. And if we see positive vagal response during HFS application, we take this area and target it for ablation. But then, after we completed the study, we retrospectively analyzed electrogram characteristics in our ablation points, and we found that there was only high or low amplitude fragmented electrograms in these areas. We didn't see any normal atrial myocardium potentials in our ablation points. So, in the next work, we decided to target just these fragmented electrograms. But to define uh, el fragmented electrograms better, we changed our bandpass filter setting from classical one to 200 and 500 hertz during GP mapping. And we targeted all fragmented electrograms, regardless of high amplitude or low amplitude in a region that is consistent with probable localization of GPs. Actually, according to anatomical data, we already know the possible localization of GPs. So if we see fragmented electrogram in this possible site, we try to eliminate all these fragmented electrograms. As another important point, <clears throat> we divided both atria and coronary sinus into seven segments to demonstrate distribution of fragmented electrograms in this area. And we found that the great majority of fragmented electrograms are located in this midline area between left atrial and right atrial structures. And this finding is compatible with the anatomical data of armor. As another important point, the number of fragmented electrograms was the lowest in the left inferior segment. This segment contains Marshall track GP and left inferior GP. And this was also compatible with anatomical data of armor at all. I briefly try to demonstrate procedural steps of our EGM guided strategy. Before uh, mapping uh, GPs, we get the quick map of right atrium and left atrium because you have to define the uh, close relationship between left atrial and right atrial structures. Please remember all these GPs are, <clears throat> great majority of these GPs are located in midline area. You can check the sinus activation uh, mapping and you can also check the voltage mapping around sinus node area. This is important, especially in the older patients because if there is significant scar tissue around sinus node area, you can think that uh, cardio ablation may be not a good option for this case, especially if the patient is older. And then, uh, after we get, get into the anatomical shell of left and right atrial structure, we change our catheter with an open irrigate valve ablation catheter. And then, we change our bandpass filter setting, and we try to detect the fragmented electrograms in these well-known areas well-known ganglionated plexus areas. You can see some example for fragmentation in the GP site. As an important point, sometimes you can see uh, fragmented electrograms in irrelevant area, for example, in here or in here, due to different causes like uh, fibrosis or if you push your catheter too much, it, it may cause uh, extra atrial beat. So you can still see some fragmentation, but you should remember the possible localization of GPs to differentiate this uh, irrelevant fragmentation. It's an important point. You can see some real-time electrogram examples for this fragmentation. Some of them is low amplitude and some of them is high amplitude, but again, it's not important. So uh, once you uh, detect the localization of fragmented electrograms, you're, you will have two ablation endpoints. You should 
completely eliminate fragmented electrograms, but you have also completely eliminate positive vagal response in this side. As, import, as an important point, in left-sided GPs, like left superior GP or Marshall tract GP or in left inferior GP, during RF application, you will usually see a positive vagal response like this. Please look at here. You can see the uh, fragmented electrograms and during RF application, you, you can see significant asystole. This is another case. We are in left superior GP sites. You can see the fragment electrograms in here and here and during RF application, positive vagal response. Now we are in Marshall track GP. Please remember the localization of it in Mitrasmus area. You can see the fragment of electrograms during RF application. You see the significant asystole. Again, <clears throat> For example, in this case, we perform two RF point in left superior GP site, but it's not enough to get just uh, make a ablation point in here. You should completely eliminate positive vagal response to say, yes, I ablated this GP site. For example, we are in the uh, third attempt, but there is still a V block during RF application. So, you are still seeing some positive vagal response and you should completely eliminate this positive vagal response too. On the contrary, ablation of right superior GP don't cause vagal response. We usually see increase on sinus rate during RF application on right superior GP sites. For example, in this case, we performed ablation left inferior GP site in left superior GP site. Please look at here. You can see significant bradycardia before ablation on right superior GP. We started the ablation in this side. You usually see such a um, increase on sinus rate just uh, starting of the RF ablation. It's very important difference between left-sided GPs and right-sided GPs according to radiofrequency response. In the next study, we should try uh, we should try to demonstrate vagal response char characteristics in different GP sites and with different GP ablation orders. In our routine approach, we start the ablation from left side of GPs and then we ablate right side of GPs. But as an important point for uh, posterior medial left GP sites. If you look at the localization of this GP, it's very close to Koch triangle or a uh, slow pathway potentials area. So it's not easy to differentiate the real cause of fragmentation in this GP site. So if we don't see any AV block history on uh, halter recordings on rest ECG or during tilt testing, we don't perform routine ablation in this GP site. Although we see some fragmentation here because you, you may be inadvertently ablate slow pathway potentials or his potentials on, and it may cause a AV block risk. So if you don't see any AV block history in the case, we don't perform ablation in this GP site. <clears throat> but what if we change our ablation order? In that study, we compared the two different ablation approach. In the first group, we started ablation with the classic uh, method from the left side of GPs. And in the second group, we started the ablation from right superior GP side. And we found that if you start from the right superior GP side, you will usually not see positive vagal response during RF application in left superior GP side. For example, in here, we started from left side of GP and during RF application, we saw a significant asystole, but in this case, Left GP ablation didn't cause any vagal response because we started the ablation from right superior GP side. <clears throat> so the question, maybe uh, you can ask that uh, maybe uh, only right superior GP ablation be enough for these cases. But I would like to demonstrate that during significant heart rate increase after right superior GP ablation, we can still see positive vagal response in some cases. This is a very important point. So today, we don't know uh, just to see a sinus rate increase is enough to say post vagar denervation. We don't know the answer of this question. And I think that the main cause of this difference responses in different GP areas 
related to different distribution of parasympathetic and sympathetic neuronal bodies within different GP sites. This is a, an animal study, but clearly demonstrate that you will see different distribution characteristics for parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation in left atrial and right atrial parts. Sometimes ablation in all left atrial GPs didn't cause an increase on sinus rate in our, some of our cases. For example, in this case, we ablated right superior GP, right inferior GP, and all other left atrial GPs, but as you see that, there is still significant sinus bradycardia. In that step, we should remember the role of aorta superior vena cava GP sites. And as you see that, during RF ablation on this GP site, we will see a significant increase on sinus rate. So after completion on ablation on all left atrial GP, and you don't see any significant increase on sinus rate, you should remember this GP sites to complete the procedure. It's very important. So case selection is the, another uh, difficult step for our uh, cardio ablation approach. For vasovagal syncope cases, the main issue to demonstrate the significant, the existence of significant asystole. And I think that you can use both loop recorders or tilt testing to demonstrate the existence of significant asystole in your cases. Two of them works very well in our uh, cardio ablation to patient selection. If you look at the latest ECG guideline for uh, Vazovaga syncope cases, actually we know that for cardio tip reflex syncope cases, guideline doesn't say anything for younger population. According to guideline, we, ho we have no option for uh, these cases. But, and I think that the most important targeted population should be this uh, relatively younger pace, uh, cases with uh, recurrent syncope episode. But if you look at the uh, published data for different groups, I think that we can also try the cardioinnervation as a first line treatment strategy in this patient population too. For older patients, we should remember that it is not easy to differentiate structural related sinus node dysfunction or AV block episodes. And it's not uh, easy to say this is reflex related in older patients. So I think that in this population, cardiac pacing might be better than cardio ablation strategy. But in all other cases, I should try cardio ablation as a first line treatment strategy. To follow up your cases, you can use both loop recorders and tilt testings to check your uh, results. For example, in this case, we clearly demonstrated completely elimination of heart rate variability after cardio ablation. And as another important point, please look at here, there is no asystole or there is no any bradycardia episodes in this case after cardio ablation strategy. And if you look at the pre-procedural and follow-up uh, tilt testing results, you can clearly see that there is no um, bradycardia after cardio ablation strategy, existence of uh, some significant uh, decrease on blood pressure. To select your cases for sinus node dysfunction, you should evaluate atropine response in all cases, and you should demonstrate positive atropine response like this. As you see that, before atropine administration, you can see the significant sinus bradycardia, but after atropine administration, you can see a good response to atropine. So you can think that this is a functional, functional sinus bradycardia or functional sinus asystole episodes. If you see a persistent AV block, again, you should evaluate the atropine response in these cases. For example, before atropine administration, you can see the AV discordance in these cases. But after atropine administration, you can see one-to-one -one AV conduction. So all the uh, existence of persistent AV block in this case, we think this should be functional related AV block. 
if you see paroxysmal AV block, you didn't see any AV block episode during rest ECG. So you should check the AV block characteristics during uh, halter recordings or loop recorder. And you should check the PP and PR interval during AV block episodes. If you see a PP prolongation during AV block episodes, or if you see a PR prolongation just before the high degree AV block episodes, you can say that this is functional AV block. These two uh, clues very important for understanding of functional AV block. What is the best ablation approach? It's not easy to say the best ablation approach, but if you look at the relevant literature, great majority of groups use biatrial ablation like us uh, in core team or uh, Pachon team. But uh, Yanyo and uh, his colleagues always use the left atrium only ablation approach in their uh, cardio ablation strategy. And right atrium only approach was used only in one study by De Bruyne et al. But I think that the most important point to understand anatomophysiological principles of ganglionated plexus. Again, I would like to demonstrate the armor's definition and we should remember that the great majority of neuronal bodies are located between left atrial and right atrial structures. So a complete vagal denervation and uh, a long to prevent long-term uh, re-innervation phenomenon, I think that to apply biatrial ablation will be better in the long term. And as another important point, if you your case has a AV block, so you should perform ablation in inferior vena cava left atrial GP or posterior medial left GP site. For example, in this case, you can see Mobitz type 1 AV block during rest ECG. This, is what, this was a persistent Mobitz type 1 AV block. So we should check the atropine response. We demonstrated complete resolution on AV block during atropine administration. So we decided to perform cardio ablation. After right superior GP ablation, you can see the significant increase on sinus rate, but there is still AV block because we should target posterior medial left GP site. So <clears throat> we started the ablation from left side. You can see AV block during uh, RF application in this side. We will see some one-to-one -one AV conduction episodes, but they will not be sustained. There is still AV block despite ablation on left side. Yes. So we should go to the right side and uh, we should perform ablation from the right side to achieve complete vagal denervation. As you see that there is a, a still AV block before ablation in this right side uh, approach, but Please look at here, the tip of our ablation catheter is very close to the left side of lesions. So we start the ablation. Yes, as you see that we achieved one-to-one -one AV conduction within a couple of uh, seconds. So the main, impo main most important issue to understand the localization of these GPs. What about long-term durability? Uh, this was the first published case with persistent AV block. And you can see the pre-procedural and post-procedural ECG. The procedure was performed in 2014. And uh, this is the, from the uh, last follow-up visit in this year. And you can still see one-to-one -one AV conduction. And there is no AV block episodes on Holter recordings. The one of the other question, what should the endpoints be? In our current approach, again, we try to completely eliminate electrograms and we completely eliminate positive vagal response in this site. But to define our clinical endpoint, we check atropine response in all cases before the procedure and we try to achieve at least 75% of post atropine response and pure interval shortening during the procedure. But recently, <clears throat> Pachon 
Define a very uh, realistic method to demonstrate your vagal denervation effect in your uh, procedure. And by applying high frequency stimulation via, uh, um, via uh, classical ablation catheter, they demonstrated the positive vagal response before the procedure and after the procedure. As you see that before the procedure, you can see significant asystole or you can see significant AV block episodes during extra cardiac vagal stimulation. And you should evaluate the positive vagal response in all steps of GP ablation. And you should uh, define your ablation endpoint by using this uh, well-designed technique. Lastly, I would like to uh, introduce some expanding horizons for cardio ablation strategy. If you remember, I said that we can also see sympathetic neuronal bodies within ganglionated plexocytes. So in our study, we tried to uh, detect impact of cardio ablation on ventricular polarization by QTC measurement. And we uh, compared biatrial cardio ablation excited only approach in whole, whole cohort Cardio ablation caused a significant and durable shortening of QTC, as you see in here. But as an important point, although biatrial and right atrial ablation caused a significant shortening or R interval, we didn't see any shortening QTC shortening effect after right-sided cardio ablation. We just see such a significant QTC shortening after biatrial cardio ablation. So again, I think that different distribution of parasympathetic and sympathetic neural bodies within different GP sites is most important to understand um, innervation principles of ganglionated plexus area. Is another important point. If you remember, some surgical GP ablation studies demonstrated a prolongation of QTC, but we found a shortening of QTC level. What was the cause of this difference? If you look at this study, uh, for, it was an uh, animal study, and Mao et al. Uh, compared GP ablation versus sham procedure. And as an acute ablation effect, they found a significant increase on atrial effective effect refractor period. But just after eight weeks, actually they found that atrial effective refractor period was lower than the baseline values. So once they checked the distribution of neuronal uh, bodies after the procedure and pre previous to procedure, they found that the density of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves in the atrium de decreased as an acute effect, but increased eight weeks after the GP ablation. And I think that nerve nervous remodeling or hyper innervation due to partial ablation was the main cause of this difference. And if you remember the, uh, our uh, data, the great majority of GPs are located between left atrial and right atrial structures. You cannot completely eliminate this close relationship by using GP, uh, surgical GP ablation. You have to apply both-sided endocardial ablation to achieve more complete vagal denervation. So GPs demonstrate clustering in well-defined anatomical areas. Their localization can be detected by using electrogram characteristics. Long-term results show that vagal denervation is durable and in well-selected patients with vasovagal syncope, sinus node dysfunction, and AV block, cardio ablation might be attempted as a first-line therapy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toga. Uh, great presentation. And we have some questions for you. <laughs> let me get to those questions. Let me, let me try to get going first one. Great talk, Toga. Really interesting. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, question here is that uh, uh, can you use the fragmentation protocol of the lateral atomic mapping system to find the fragmented electrogram? What do you think about it? Um, thank you so much. It's a very important question. Actually, we just uh, try to uh, find uh, virtually our uh, fragmented electrogram because um, no 
uh, through the mapping system or no software uh, can get this uh, distrib discrimination for you. So you have to check fragmented electrograms your eyes. Uh, so, but I think that it's not a difficult procedure because you actually already know the possible localization of this GPs. So you should go to these areas and just try to find fragmented electrograms by using your eyes. But I hope in future, maybe uh, we can get such a software and maybe uh, usage of uh, multi-mapping catheters, high resolution multi-mapping catheters would be better to demonstrate this fra uh, fragmentation during the pr procedure. There is another question here, Tonga. If you were able to establish, to see some anatomical correlation between the GP location and some sort of fibrosis, if there is something that you could use to identify the areas of GP using some sort of image modality? Actually, it's, it's a very difficult question. Yes, it's not easy in all cases to differentiate uh, fibrosis with uh, uh, GP-related fragmentation. Actually, uh, the great majority of these cases are younger, so we usually don't see any significant uh, scar tissue in these cases because actually existence of structural heart disease uh, seems as a exclusion criteria for these cases because it's not easy to differentiate uh, existence of structural heart disease. But you you can check the um, response to atrial pacing in this area, for example. But um, usually we don't see significant fibrosis around these GP areas. And anatomically, if you remember, we can see uh, fibrosis in, posterior, for example, posterior wall of left atrium, usually. But there is no significant GP area in posterior wall. So I think that in this case, especially in these younger cases, fibrosis is not a significant problem for uh, discrimination. Wonderful. Uh, can you clarify, uh, what's your current approach, what you were doing? Are you starting from the right side, the GPs, or are you starting from the left side of the GPs? Left side of GPs, because if you, if you ablate right side of GPs first, uh, we cannot eliminate uh, uh, vagal response in left side of GPs. So we don't have any uh, data uh, to demonstrate just ablation on right superior GPs enough for this case. So, I started left side of GPs in current not, not to lose the end point, I see. Yes. Another question here is that what, what is your strategy in a young patient with AV block? Can you do only the posterior uh, medial left GP ablation? Actually, uh, I, again, I start from left side of GPs and then I ab ablated uh, right superior GP side. But if, if, Usually, we cannot get one-to-one -one AV conduction without ablating posterior medial left GP sites. I, I, I just uh, achieved one-to-one -one AV conduction by using right superior GP ablation in uh, one or two cases, just one or two cases. And in all others, I also ablated posterior medial left GP sites to achieve one-to-one -one AV conduction. But you have no cases where you went just for that GP and no. not the other ones? No, no. I didn't try, just a, a, a limited ablation okay. in that side. There is and I think that just ablation of a posterior medial left GP side will not be enough in any cases. Because in some cases, uh, I started from posterior medial left GP side. Although you can uh, achieve one-to-one -one AV conduction, you usually see a a very long, prolong, a very long PR interval after ablation on this GP side. So you should a little bit more uh, perform vagal denervation by using right superior GP ablation, because in long term it will be a problem for you. I think that. There is another question here. Uh, when do you consider to go for epicardio ablation of GPs? Yes. This is very Tough important. One. Um, this is a very important question, but again, I think that, yes, we know uh, these GPs are located in the subepicardial area, but please remember that this GP is actually uh, located between left atrial and uh, left right atrial structures. And I think that 
it's not easy to uh, achieve this type epicardially too. So I think that biatrial ablation via endocardial route will be better than uh, epicardial ablation. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, there are few reported cases of uh, delayed AV blocks after slow pathway ablation, maybe weeks or months after that. Sorry, um, I had a problem with computer again, please. No problem, sorry. There are some uh, case reports of delayed AV blocks, maybe weeks or months after slow pathway ablation for AV yes. and RT. Yes. Do you have any experience in, in denervation in those cases? Yes, actually, in the, uh, in the case I demonstrated with persistent AV block and, and, and demonstrated the long-term effect of cardio ablation in a patient with persistent AV block. Actually, in this case, in this case we performed AV and RT ablation before the procedure in uh, two years ago. And uh, also uh, some groups from Europe published such a cases. And yes, uh, you can see such a phenomenon, but the most important point is to demonstrate complete resolution after atropine administration. If you don't see any resolution on AV conduction after atropine, you don't try to cardio ablation. This is a very important point. But it's funny because if you do, it has some sort of, uh, you probably during the slow pathway ablation, you change somehow the innervation of the AV node. Yes, sure. Totally agree with you. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Considering the possible role of parasympathetic system in Brugada syndrome, would you see any benefits from this technique in these patients? Um, it's, it's not a... a simple question because uh, we, ho we have no data, but um, I think that in patients with Brugada syndrome or uh, some uh, other uh, cases, uh, I think that cardio ablation will also cause some sympathetic denervation effect if you perform a complete denervation protocol like our approach. So maybe you can see some benefit after cardio ablation strategy, but it's not easy to differentiate uh, what is the cause of this uh, benefit, parasympathetic denervation or little bit sympathetic denervation. And it's not easy to demonstrate contribution of different part of autonomic nerve system in these cases. Uh, again, uh, we, we can also imagine that in some cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can still see uh, vasovagal syncope episodes in these cases due to contractile hyperactivity, but um, we don't know the uh, results of uh, cardio ablation in such a cases because we didn't apply the procedure in any structural heart disease cases. Okay. Along uh, those lines, there's an, we have another question here. Uh, what's your opinion about doing a uh, vagal denervation of cryoablation during AF ablation? And uh, do you, if you have any observations on the durability issues compared to RF? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. Um, I think uh, Tiago from uh, Brussels uh, has a, such a study, published study, and they used uh, extra cardiac vagal stimulation to check vagal denervation effect of cryo balloon. And they demonstrated the vagal denervation effect after cardio ablation strategy, but it's not a uniform response because, as I mentioned before, distribution of or localization of GPs demonstrates significant difference from one patient to another. So uh, it's totally related to uh, distribution characteristics of the patient. In some cases, yes, you can. If, for example, left superior GP may be close to the left superior pulmonary vein ostium. So in this case, you can ablate this GP. But in others, it will be very antral area. So it will not be possible to ablate. So just try to achieve vagal denervation. For example, your indication is vasovagal syncope. There is no atrial fibrillation history. To perform cryobalon, I think it's not a realistic approach. But if there is a V block, sorry, if there is uh, atrial fibrillation episodes also, maybe you can try just PVI by using cryoballoon and check the vagal response characteristics in these cases. So it's, it's maybe works in such a population. Great, uh, one other question here. 
any situation you would do a repeat ablation and what's the recurrence uh, rate according to your experience? <clears throat> Actually, uh, it depends on the indication for the procedure. If you perform the procedure for AV block, you should see more uh, recurrence because it's not easy to differentiate functional AV block from the structural ones. According to our experience, we see, um, I think, 15% recurrence after ablation for AV block cases. But in Vazovaga syncope cases, I only see one cases with recurrent cardioinmaturity response. Okay. Uh, any side effects uh, over long term, such as sinus tachycardia? Uh, what's your experience about that? Yeah, perfect, perfect question. Actually, you can see inappropriate sinus tachycardia in some cases, and we we see uh, four cases like that. And uh, in great majority of these cases, uh, actually we see significant increase on sinus rate, but I think that uh, the patient are still happy because they are afraid of si uh, significant asystole episodes. So they don't say anything about their sinus tachycardia because they check their ECGs and they say, oh, I am okay because I'm, my heart rate is still uh, good. But I, I think this is the most important uh, issue why we don't see such a high inappropriate sinus tachycardia ratio in our case series. Actually, we see a significant increase on sinus rate, but patients say, I am okay. But if, you patient, if your patient has symptoms related to sinus tachycardia, you can use uh, beta blockers or evabredin, and evabredin is very well uh, for this uh, situation, I think. I had some, uh, I had one cases with evabredin treatment after cardiomyopathy. Okay. Uh, what, what do you do currently on your AF patients? Do you add uh, GP ablation to your AF cases? Do you check for vagal responses? What's your approach? Perfect question. Actually, uh, if there is no vagal mediated atrial fibrillation history, we don't add GP ablation in any atrial fibrillation cases. But uh, I think we have 21 or 24, uh, 22 cases with vagal mediated atrial fibrillation and, we, and uh, other, some uh, other uh, functional AV block or functional sinus node dysfunction episodes in these cases. And we performed PVI plus GP ablation in these cases. But I think the most important issue, uh, GP ablation only is enough for these cases or not. I think that if the patient is older than 40 years old or maybe 50 years old, I think that you should always add PVI for these cases because Kavanaugh et al. Demo clearly demonstrated that just GP ablation will not be uh, enough for these cases, although they are uh, um, vocal mediated atrial fibrillation episodes. This is my idea. Yeah. I uh, have another question here. Uh, being a similar procedure to PVI, what about complications? Are they similar to PVI? Actually, uh, it's not similar. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, I think that in PVI, during PVI, you have to create some linear uh, lesions and you don't have to, uh, you should, uh, try to get more uh, close uh, ablation point, but during cardio ablation strategy, sometimes just one ablation point will be enough to get complete elimination of uh, fragmented electrograms or all positive bagar response in that side. Because if you look at our data, the number of RA points uh, was um, about 20 and uh, 30. So it's very, very limited ablation. Although we can perform ablation in different part of atrium, actually we just perform one or two ablation point in all sites. So it's it's uh, very easy according to PVI because Definitely. in PVI you have to achieve bidirectional block or something like that. 
And, and you have to perform ablation in posterior wall, but we don't perform ablation in posterior wall of left atrium. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, esophagus is not an issue, right? By the way, what's the most difficult GP to ablate? Which one that requires more RF? Sorry? What is the most difficult GP to ablate? Ones that require um, more RF applications? Yes, I think for me, posterior medial left GP. Because I always afraid to ablate uh, some other areas. Because especially in right superior GP side, contact will not be a problem. Yes, you have to perform a couple of ablation points, but just uh, pull back your catheter in the different area and it's very easy. So it's also true for the other GP sites, but in posterior medial left GP, because you will see some other effect and uh, during ablation on posterior medial left GP site, for example, you will see some high degree AV block episodes, but you cannot be sure it is related with vagal overactivity or you ablate a uh, fast pathway. It's, yeah. it's, so it's, it's very difficult. Do you stop the application to check? Or what, how do you do it to differentiate? If you, Actually, have it, I always if you have AV block stop. during the posterior medial GP ablation. Yes, I always stop and wait, stop and wait. Because in other GP side, it's easy. Yes, I, I, I uh, wait this response. I can go on the procedure. But if you are in the posterior medial left GP side and you see such a response, you should, you have to wait because you cannot discriminate. Okay, yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, I think we have coming to the last question here. Do you see this technique moving into the mainstream and what further studies are required for guideline recognition and widespread adoption? Future. Yes, um, I, I think that the most important study would uh, uh, be a comparison. For example, uh, with uh, cardiac pacing for vasovagal syncopiasis, we should need a comparison study. For example, with uh, cardiac pacing, one head-to-head -head comparison, and we may perform a sham procedure study, for example, for vasovagal syncope cases to detect possible placebo effect of the cardioneurablation strategy. Uh, and I think that the usage of implantable root recorder will be very important to demonstrate long-term effect of real long-term effect of cardioneurablation strategy and which is the best method to decide this one. Because in some cases, you cannot be sure uh, about complete elimination of vagal responses. Please remember the AFib data. For example, by using Holter recordings, you can say that, yes, I completely eliminate atrial fibrillation episode, but if you implant a loop recorder, you will see a lot of atrial fibrillation recurrences. So it's also true for uh, vagal denervation. I think that usage of implantable loop recorder during follow-up will demonstrate the real effect of cardioneurablation strategy in future. So, thank you very much, Tonga. Uh, this was a great presentation. We had 70 people watching your, your lecture. We had lots of questions here, and especially a lot of people is asking for a link so they can review the presentation at home in the next couple of days. So, I will, we are recording this presentation, and for those who want to see it later on, please send me an email. I just sent you an email on the, the chat uh, site and I'll be more than happy. I, I assume I can do that, right? Or I can I can share your talk with everybody else. And yes, I and, and thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for us, a great teaching. And then let's see if we can do this, we can do more of this in the near future. Okay, my friend. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Eduardo, thank you very much for your help. And I think we'll see each other again in the near future. Sure. Thank you very much. It was a really a great session. I truly enjoyed and I think we should do more often. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you Bye. very much, guys. So I'm closing the session right now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.